I'm going to start by giving you a statement this morning, and I'm going to see how you might finish this in your own mind. I wonder what, how you would finish this to say, I could never, and insert something. What would you put in there? I could never skydive, maybe? Maybe that's for you. <laughs> I could never handle a spider. <laughs> maybe that's you. I could never eat sushi. Maybe for some of you, that's the case. Maybe for others, it's I could never do public speaking. I've seen stats that show uh, that many people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of death, which is insane. <laughs> but I think for a lot of us, there are things in our mind that we have decided that I could never now, uh, many moons ago, I used to work in outdoor rec and outdoor education and had the privilege of taking people through activities like the flying fox and the giant swing. <laughs> and I remember so many times when I would be at the giant swing that we'd have groups come and there'd be kids or there'd be adults. It wouldn't really matter that there was no difference sometimes. And always in every group, there was at least one person that would look at the giant swing and go, I could never do that. <laughs> I could never do that. Yet, of course, when they're there with a the group, the group all starts to cheer them on and egg them on. And I don't know if it's peer pressure or if it's motivation, if there's a line between the two. <laughs> but eventually, many of these people often have a go. And so they would come to me, and I would be there ready to harness them in. And I could see them. They'd be shaking, sometimes sweaty and nervous. And they'd look up at the size of the giant swing, and they'd say, Ryan, I, I don't think I can do this. And I would say, sure you can. You can do this. And so with the help of their friends there, they would harness in and we'd start to pull them up. And they'd go up two or three meters and say, stop, <laughs> that's high enough. And we're looking at them going, are you sure? And again, they, their friends cheer them on and eventually they go higher and higher and they're up the top and I can see them ready to come down. And the problem is you have to pull the, the rope yourself to release you. <laughs> and they're going, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> but eventually these people go, all right. I can do this. And so they pull the cord and whoosh, down they come. And you can hear the screaming from a mile away. <laughs> and they go back and forth, and eventually they come down. Now, you would think that at the end of that, that they'd be traumatized. But at the end of it, they're buzzing. Their eyes are wide open because they have just done something that they thought they could never do, and yet they succeeded. And there's this great sense of accomplishment and realization of what they're actually capable of. And so for me, it was a really special experience sharing that with people, seeing them go through that journey of going, I could never do this, to then coming away victorious going, yeah, I did that. You see, for me, uh, when I think about our faith, I think for a lot of us have statements where we say, I could never. I could never go and maybe share my faith with a stranger. For some of you, that's an I could never that you carry in your mind. For others of you, you go, I could never teach anything. I could never teach in a small group. I could never teach in a kid's program. I could never. For others of you, you go, I could never be in leadership. I could never be on the board or the eldership. I've heard people say that. Or maybe for others of you, it's going, I, just could, I could never commit to something like that. You see, in our faith, we carry around these I could never statements. And I carried these around, and I have to wrestle with these when they pop up in my own life. One for me was, I used to say this a lot, I could never be a worship leader. <laughs> you know how that turned out. <laughs> I used to say I could never be a worship leader. And after that, I said, you know, I could never be a pastor. And the reason why I thought in my heart I could never be a pastor was because I had seen pastors that have gone before me, that have burnt out, that have made mistakes, that have given up on their faith altogether. And I looked at that and I thought, you know what, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to risk my faith or my family over something to do with church leadership. And so in my heart of hearts as a young person, when I looked at the church, I said, I could never be a pastor. I don't want to do that. I carried these I could never statements in my life. And if you have ever carried an I could never statement, you're actually in good company every time you open up the scriptures. Because when we look into God's word, we see story after story of people who kept, who kept saying, I could never. And God would come to them and say, I want you to do something. And they would respond by saying, I could never do that, God. You might know the story of Moses. Moses had a stutter. And God was saying, I want you to go before Pharaoh and speak to him. And Moses is going, I could never do that. Moses used a lot of excuses to try and get out because he had this belief in him that I could never do that. Maybe you know the story of Gideon. 
Okay, Gideon was approached by, by God to actually fight on behalf of his people. And Gideon's going, I could never do that. I come from the weakest, smallest clan. I'm the weakest and smallest in my family. I could never do that. Or maybe you know the story of Abram, Abraham and Sarah. God said to them, you're going to have a child. And they were old, like they were, they were old. <laughs> and so Abraham laughs at God. He laughs because in his heart of hearts, he said, I could never do that. We could never have a child. And so if you carry an I could never in your faith experience, you are in great company when we open God's word. But the thing that we need to realize is when we say that I could never, we're actually saying something deeper and more profound than just that. See, when we say that I could never do something, what we're actually saying is that God could never do that. Could you tick that over, please? God could never do that through me. And that's a profound statement, isn't it? Because when we look at ourselves and we experience our own limitations, we say, I could never do that. But what we're really saying is maybe God is limited. Maybe God is so limited that he couldn't work through a fragile person like me, a person that doesn't maybe have skills or training or experience in something. We think that God could not work through us. And so when we start to believe that, when we actually start to hold on to that and let it sink into our heart, what happens is when we look at church and our faith, we start to step back and we go, you know what, I'm going to leave that to the professionals. I'm going to leave that to people who are more gifted, more talented, more experienced than me. And the result of that is we start becoming spectators. Or another word for that is we become spiritual consumers. We go, I'm not going to contribute because I'm not good enough. And that's what's at the heart of that lie. The heart of that lie is that thought of going, I'm not good enough. And so we say, somebody else can do that. It's not for me. And I believe that the temptation that we face is to allow our I could never statements to determine how God might want to use us. When an opportunity comes our way, are we going to let that I could never statement determine what God wants to do in our life? Or will we trust him? Will we trust him enough to say, you know what, God, I don't think I can do that, but I trust you. And I trust what you could do through a fragile person like me. And if we embrace that, then we actually enter into the story of the scriptures and we are just like every other hero of the faith who thought God could never use them. And we get to go on a journey and adventure with him. And so this morning, I want to help reorientate our thinking. Reorientate our thinking about the way that we see ourselves. And the way that we believe what God could or could not do through each of us. And we're doing this as part of our series called All In. And so we're, this morning, it's all about how do we contribute? How do we get involved? How do we say yes to God so that we can be all in for Jesus in this strange world that we're in? Because I believe God is calling us to be a group of people that say yes to him. Yes to what he wants to do and yes to the opportunities that he's bringing before us. And so what does the Bible say? What does the Bible actually say about the way that God might want to work through you and I? Well, in order to look at that, I want to take you into a passage in 1 Peter. And so this is Peter, Peter, uh, the disciple of Jesus, who is writing this letter. And I believe that he makes a profound statement here about our value and the way that we participate in what God is doing on this earth. And so it comes from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 to 11. And this is what it says. Peter says, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. And then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. What an interesting verse. And I think an interesting verse for us to sit and reflect on. Because the first thing I see in here is that God has given each of you a gift. Do you realize that? God has given each of you a spiritual gift. 
For a lot of us, we sit there and go, maybe I missed out. <laughs> maybe, maybe everyone else got all the good gifts and I didn't really get a spiritual gift. I don't have anything to offer. You know, as we open this, Peter says that God has given every single one of you a gift of some description. And we don't want to overlook that or miss what God has given us. And here Peter says that we are to use our gifts to serve one another. Our spiritual gifts, the things that God has hardwired into us, they're not just for our benefit. Our spiritual gifts are for the benefit of other people. We are to use them to serve one another, to serve the body of Christ, to serve our community. That's why God has given them to us. And since that's the case, when we don't think about the gifts that we have to bring, when we withhold the gifts that we have to bring, there is something that is missing, something that is lacking in God's church and in the wider world when we choose not to engage. When we choose to believe that lie to say, I could never, I don't have anything to offer. I love that in this passage that Peter talks about the gift of helping others. Because so often when we think about spiritual gifts, we think about loud things. We think about charismatic things. We think about things that happen up the front, on the stage, in the spotlight. And we go, I couldn't do that. But I love that he talks about the gift of helping others. Do you realize that the gift of helping somebody else is a spiritual gift? Do you realize that? The gift of encouragement is a spiritual gift. All through scripture, there are lists of different kinds of spiritual gifts. The gift of administration is a spiritual gift. You might sit there thinking, well, my ability to be organized and on time and planned, what has that got to do with anything? But God has given that to you as a gift to his church and as a gift to the wider community. Each of you have a spiritual gift. And as we think about that, it's easy to go, well, maybe my gift isn't important. Maybe I don't have a very big part to play. Maybe I'm not essential to what God is wanting to do. But if you think that, if you feel that, I want to show you another scripture passage. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as it speaks more about spiritual gifts. And here Paul is using the metaphor of the body, the body of Christ, the body and the different spiritual gifts that make that up. And let's just read that. Verse 14, he says, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how, how would you hear? If your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can never say to the feet, I don't need you. And then later on in verse 27, at the end of this segment, he says, all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. I love this picture that Paul paints for us. And you've got to understand that at that point in the Corinthians church, they're talking about spiritual gifts. They're talking about prophecy and tongues and all these different things. They're trying to figure out how they're meant to run and host a church service. And, and, and amongst them, there's like this pecking order that's developing where they start going, well, maybe the person who speaks in tongues is the most spiritual among us. Or maybe those that have a word of encouragement or a prophecy, maybe they're the most spiritual among us. And they fall into the trap of trying to judge one another, of compare one another to see where they rank in terms of their spiritual maturity and wisdom. And yet Paul comes to them and says, guys, that is not what this is about. Don't you get it? You are all part of the one body. And so that's where this metaphor comes. And he starts to explain going, each part of the body has its significance. And if you lose one part of the body, the entire body struggles. And so out of this, when I read this, I see that Paul is saying that every gift is essential to the body of Christ. We spoke about the body of Christ a couple of weeks ago. The body of Christ is the church, the gathered people here on earth as in heaven. That's, that's the body of Christ. And so what Paul is saying is that every spiritual gift, every person has a part to play, everything that God has given you is essential to what he wants to do here on earth, here in our community, here in our midst. Every gift is absolutely essential to the body. 
Now, it's interesting as we think about the body, I've experienced part of this issue in my life. Um, a little while ago, I had a thing called an ingrown toenail. Has anyone had that before? <laughs> ingrown toenail. And I did what any great guy would do, and I ignored it. <laughs> I ignored it and thought, don't worry, it'll fix itself. I'll just keep pushing on. And so I keep walking and doing things, and a few days pass, and suddenly my toe is, is really hurting. And so I continued to ignore it. And after a while, it wasn't my toe that became the issue. It was actually the rest of my leg. You see, the rest of my leg was trying to compensate for the fact that I wasn't walking properly. And so suddenly I'm getting pain up in here, pain up in here, pain in my lower back. And all of a sudden I'm struggling to walk. I'm struggling to get around and I'm feeling like I'm aging. I'm going, what is going on here? But isn't it fascinating how one small thing, when it's not working properly, impacts the rest of the body? You see, my ingrown toenail had the potential to cripple me in some ways. It had the potential to cause other parts of my body to have to overcompensate, to overwork. And because I didn't try to repair that or fix it or kind of engage that part of my body well, the rest of my body was paying the price. One small thing like that can impact every part of my body. And now I want to bring that back into when we think about the church as the spiritual body. When we miss one small part, when there are some of you who say, I could never and believe that you could never contribute anything. When we withhold our gifts, when we don't get involved in what God wants to do in the body of Christ, it's like we're cutting off a toe. It's like we're removing a body part. And the result is that the entire body aches and struggles because that part is missing. You see, if your part is missing, the rest of the body struggles. When one part is missing, other people start burning out. Other people start doing too much. Other parts of the body begin to ache. Every gift that God has given us is essential to the body of Christ. And you have a spiritual gift. You have things to offer God has given you something, and I wonder what that is. You see, when God looks at you, I don't think God sees a person who can't. Even when we look in the mirror and we say, I could never, God doesn't see that in us. When God looks at you, he sees a spiritual resource, somebody who he has placed for a purpose, for a season, for a reason. When he looks at you, he sees a gift that he has given to our church and to our community. And God intends to use you. And so since God has given each of us a gift, and since every gift is absolutely essential, I believe that we are to be spiritual contributors and not spiritual consumers. We are to be spiritual contributors in the body of Christ. God has put us here to get involved and to contribute and to bring the gifts that he has given us. He hasn't hardwired us to just be consumers or spectators. We are not wired to sit back and let everything, you know, say, leave that to the professionals, leave that to someone with more experience. God actually desires for each one of us to be actively involved in what he is doing in this world. You see, God's got a mission and he's inviting us to partner with him. And so we are invited to be spiritual contributors, not simply spiritual consumers. Now, if I was just to be honest with you for a moment, as I look at our church, post this pandemic, post COVID-19, as I look at our church, I've got to be honest, our church is crippled and struggling. Right now, we get to celebrate because financially, we're doing so well. We want to honor all of you for your giving and the way that you're supporting what we are doing as a ministry. We are hitting budget. We are doing so, so well on that front. And yet we are crippled and we are struggling. We are struggling just to run sometimes a basic church service. We struggle to have enough people involved in tech and greeting and kids and all these different things. We are struggling at the moment. And to help you see that, I want to show you a couple of stats, a bit of a snapshot of where our church is at at the moment. Now, when you look at our church at the moment, we have about 178 people that we would call church regulars, people that call this church home. And out of that, 124 are 18 and over, so they are our adults. We've got about 54 um, teens and young people in this church. And so we've got 124 active adults in our church. And yet when you look at the stats right now, about 18% of those people are involved in one activity in our church. 
And when I say involved, I mean serving, volunteering, getting involved. Maybe that's a hospitality roster. Maybe that's tech. Maybe that's running a life group or being involved in a kids program. Only about 18% are involved in one activity. We have 23% that are involved in multiple activities. And when I say multiple, I'm not just talking two. Many of these people are on multiple rosters, multiple ministries, serving during the week and on the weekends, week in and week out. And the reason why I've put that in red there is because I have a very real concern that some people are actually doing too much. But as I look at these stats right now, 59% of our 18s and over are not currently involved in any ministry or any um, activity that we are running together as a church. And as I look at that, it breaks my heart. And it concerns me, and it concerns me on a number of levels. Because as I said, that red category there, I am concerned that there are people in this church, like with my leg, that are overcompensating. They are great people with a real heart for our church and our community. And when they see a gap, they go, don't worry, I'm going to fill that gap. And they keep saying yes and yes and yes. And the hard thing is sometimes I talk to people and I say, let's strip it back. Let's do less. You're doing too much. And they say, I can't because I want that ministry to go ahead. I can't let that fall. And so like with my leg, other parts of the body are overcompensating, overworking and hurting as a result. That's my first concern. My second concern is that 59% are not actively involved. That means 59% of the spiritual gifts that God has blessed our community with are not reflected or represented in our ministry activities or in our wider community. 59% of God's gifts to us are not part of what we are doing with our mission. And that's a concern for me because I think there are spiritual gifts. I think there are contributions out there in our church that are absolutely essential to what God is calling us to do. Now, for some of you, you are highly involved in this church pre-COVID. Highly involved. You're on multiple rosters and ministry and activities. And COVID has come. It's been like a big bomb, hasn't it? Just just took everything out. Now, for some of us, our ministry areas that we were involved in before have closed. We don't have the same rosters that we had before. We don't run the same programs that we ran before. And so maybe what the area that you are a part of no longer exists. That's a very real reality. That is something that for many of us, we grieve and go, it's not the way that it used to be. We long for and we miss the way that we used to be involved. For others of you in this COVID season, you've just found the pressure all too much. And I'm the first to say that I get that. I think one of the gifts that we had last year was actually the opportunity to stop and to rest, to slow down and to reevaluate the many things that we've been juggling and trying to do in our lives. And so we have two options going forward as a church. One option is that we empower people into their gifts, into the things that God has called them to do, so that we can run the ministries and the activities that we sense God wants to do in our midst here. That's one option. The other option is that I start to scale things back, that we start to close ministry areas so that we don't allow people to overwork and overextend too far. They're the two options that we have. But here's the thing. I'm inclined to think that we have everything that we need. I'm inclined to think that we have every resource that we need for this season because God has given each one of you as a gift to this church. He's given your spiritual gifts, your experience, your wisdom, your contributions, so that in a time such as this, that the body of Christ can be representing Jesus on earth as in heaven. And so I'm inclined to think that we have everything that we need to succeed. You see, God has called us to be a church that that reflects heaven on earth. He's called us to be a church that brings relief for the disadvantaged, that brings hope to the hopeless, that preaches the name of Jesus joyfully and boldly. That's the kind of church that we have been called to be. Yet I believe that we can only do that when every part works together when every part brings their gifts and their contributions to the body. And so what is the invitation? The invitation this morning for each of us, I believe, is to be a spiritual contributor in our community, to change the way that we see ourselves, to no longer sit there and say, I could never, I could never do that. To actually change the way that we think and say, you know what, because God is with me, Because God has given me the gift of his spirit and some some gifts and talents to go with that, I can and I could and I will. 
The invitation I think God is extending to us to be all in for him in this season is to be spiritual contributors in our community. And so how do we do that? How do we be a spiritual contributor? Well, to me, it's as simple as this. I believe all of us need to find one way that we can get involved with what God is doing in this place. One way that we can get involved with what God is doing, that is all it takes. Because I believe that when each of us carry a light load, no one carries a heavy load. When each of us bring our gifts to the table, the body of Christ is blessed. And as a result, our world is blessed. It only takes each of us to find one way that we can get involved. And you know what? When we look at the opportunities that we say, I could never, it just makes me wonder. It makes me wonder what God might want to teach you as you step into something that you thought you could never do before. How might God want to grow you? How might God want to stretch you? And would you be prepared to give him that space and that opportunity in your life to say, Lord, I don't think I can do this, but I sense that you're with me. And so I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to give it a go and trust that you are faithful and trust that you're going to show up and trust that I'm not going to be the same person as a result of that experience. I'm going to trust that you can grow me and stretch me. And so as we look at how do we get involved, what's one thing we can do? There's a few questions that we can ask. We can say, what are my skills and gifts? Sometimes I think we get a little bit too spiritual when we talk about spiritual gifts. You know, we, we start thinking that it's, it's got to be things that we can't see or explain, but spiritual gifts are very tangible and practical. So what are your skills? Can you build? Are you handy that way? Are you great with computers? Are you great with people? Are you good at listening? Are you good with kids? Have you got time and space in your week? Have you got time and space on your weekend? What are your skills? What are your gifts? What has God given you? You might ask the question, what am I good at? Or what do I enjoy? Sometimes our passions are an indication of our calling. They're actually a passion that God has given us for a reason to actually help us go into a certain area or aspect of his mission. Or maybe we might look and say, where is there a need that I can meet? It's not always about just the things that we enjoy, because there's always things in life we don't enjoy. But it's going, where is there a need? Where is there a gap? And how can I stand in that gap and fill that part in the body of Christ? We can all ask these questions and discern together to understand what are my contributions? What is God calling me to do as a part of this church? Now, for us, there are a number of areas that right now we need some help in. I'm going to tell you about a couple of these. The first is in our tech and online hosting stuff. I mean, how many of you here have ever used Facebook Messenger? Have you ever used that before? Okay, online hosting is about as complex as Facebook Messenger. If you can type on your phone or a tablet or a laptop, you can host online. And we would love to have more people that are online here chatting, praying, just connecting with people. Our tech team at the back, right now we only have two people up there. We really need three as a bare minimum. But for the last couple of months, we've barely been able to get two people up there. And yet without the tech, we can't have microphones and screens and online and all of the rest that holds this together. Right now, we need life group leaders. We so often have people come to me and say, Ryan, is there a new life group that I can join? And we say, yes, there is. But so many of our groups have been filling up. And that's a great thing. People are in groups. But we need to multiply. We need to create space. It's like we need to create empty chairs for new people to come into those groups. We need people who are willing to lead life groups. Scripture and Breakfast Club are always just on the edge of a knife. You know, we brought that to you at the end of last year, and praise God, we've got Rosemary and Leanne that have been doing ministry in Scripture, but we need more people in Scripture and in Breakfast Club because the reality is, is we can't sustain those ministries if we don't have more involvement. Our hub in particular needs more people. And right now, we've got a great team doing community lunch, but we need more people downstairs in the pantry. We need more people from this church representing Jesus downstairs in that moment when people are coming in need. And there's a new thing that we're going to kick off. A new thing, because right now, we don't have a hospitality roster. I know many of you have grieved the fact that we have lost that and we're using automated systems. Well, that's part of what the problem has been. We haven't had enough people. And so what we're going to do is we want to make a family feast team. Because with COVID-19, it's hard to do the potluck thing that we used to do. 
And so instead, we want to create a roster of people who love hospitality and perhaps once a month invite a group of five or six people to provide something as a family feast. Maybe it's a few pots of soup and some bread rolls. Maybe it's some sausages on a barbecue. Maybe it's some sandwiches that are made up. Whatever it is, we want to invite groups of people with gifts and hospitality to be a part of this so that our culture of feasting together can continue even amongst all the restrictions and challenges that we have. Now, look, there are so many ministry areas that I haven't even mentioned yet. There are so many ways that you can be a part of what God is doing here in this church. And so what we're going to do today is after this service, we have what we are calling sign-up stations. And over here, we're going to have uh, two tables. One table, we're going to have uh, representatives from men and, men and women's ministry there sharing about the events and retreats and activities that are coming up. So you can sign up for some of those things. And next to that, we have a table with a list of things that you might want to get involved in. Ways that you can get involved in our Sunday services or our midweek activities or our hub community services. There's a sign-up sheet there. And we would love for all of you to come over and have a look. To have a look and think about how can I get involved? Where do my gifts fit in this picture? What is God calling me to do? And so we're going to create some space after the service where you can sign up, where you can get involved. And we'll have that here this week and next week so that you all have the opportunity. And for anyone who's online this morning, I realize you can't physically sign up, but you can put something in the chat and just say, I would love to get involved with this ministry. Or you could email us. Just talk to your host that's on there. We would love for you to be a part of what we're doing here as a church. And so let me just now recap what we've talked about. We started off by saying that many of us carry that, that fear that I could never but when we say that I could never, what we're actually saying is that God could never use me in that way. And yet we've seen that each of us has a spiritual gift. And every gift is absolutely essential to the body of Christ. And so we are called to be spiritual contributors, not, not just spiritual consumers. And how we do that is to find one way. One way that God might want to use our gifts, our skills in the body of Christ and within our community. And so I want you to ask these questions. What are my skills and gifts? What am I good at? What do I enjoy? Where is there a need that I can fill? And together, after the service, you can punch it in the chat. You can speak to us at the sign-in stations. We can gather and work together around what God wants to do in our church. And so for me, as we wrap this up, I guess I wonder, I wonder what is possible for us as a church if all of our spiritual gifts were being represented. I wonder what would be possible, what we could do, and what we could achieve. I hope that you would help us discover that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have given us every resource that we need, that you are here with us, that you have given us the gift of your Holy Spirit, and Lord, that you have blessed us with so many different talents and skills. Lord Jesus, I pray this morning that you would help us to overcome our fears. I, I pray that you would help us to overcome that, that thought that I could never. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust that you could work through us, through the things that you have given us. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that there would be a releasing of spiritual gifts in our church. I pray that there would be new ministries that are formed because of people that are here. I pray that there would be ministries that are strengthened. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that new people would come to know you because of our contributions, our gifts that we bring. And so, Jesus, we are excited. We're excited for the future of our church and excited for what you want to do here. So we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in our hearts, with our gifts, in our homes, in our church, and in our community. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.